Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Block Real Estate Services live webinar and Q&A session with CrowdStreet. My name is Hunter Meath, Investor Relations Manager here at CrowdStreet, and today I am pleased to have Aaron Mesmer, VP of Development and Acquisitions, who will discuss the Royale at City Place offering on the CrowdStreet Marketplace. After the short presentation, we will open it up for questions, and at this time, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you have a question during the presentation or the Q&A, please type it into the questions box and we'll be sure and ask it on your behalf. And with that, I will let Aaron take it away. Well, thank you, Hunter. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate everyone's time today. Um, as Hunter mentioned, we will be taking a few minutes to walk through the Royale at City Place. Um, the Royale at City Place is a 344 unit luxury apartment property in Overland Park, Kansas. Um, I think what I'll probably do is start with the, the municipality and, and kind of where we are in the world here, and then our firm in terms of a background of our company, uh, and then I'll move into the property specifics. But I think that the, the setting of the stage is important, especially in this particular case. Um, the Royale is located at City Place, and City Place is a mixed-use master plan community that our firm has been working on actually since about 2013. Um, the property is an infill site located at College Boulevard and 69 Highway in Overland Park. For those that aren't familiar with Overland Park, uh, Overland Park is the executive uh, sort of corridor for the Kansas City metropolitan area. Kansas City as a whole is a city of about 2 million people. Um, there is a, a, a combination of sort of urban environments and, and suburban environments that make up the metro area on both sides of the state line in Kansas and Missouri, uh, five counties and, and dozens and dozens of different municipalities. Overland Park and, and Leewood in particular, South Johnson County, where this is, uh, really represents the premium uh, portion of our market. Uh, in particular, um, City Place is located within the Blue Valley School District. The Blue Valley School District in, in the state of Kansas has four of the top five high schools uh, in terms of ACT rankings and academic performance uh, on an annual basis year in, year out. So there's a lot of people that want to be in this particular area. Um, the other thing that I think is significant about the location of the property itself is being at the intersection of College Boulevard and 69 Highway, 69 is really the, the north-south connector from downtown Kansas City to this, this sort of executive suburban area. Um, and College Boulevard is, and, and has been for more than 30 years, the premier office address in our market. And so if you look at College Boulevard, what you'll find is uh, the headquarters of several major companies, um, thank you, Hunter, for putting that up on the screen, but you've got Sprint's World Headquarters is here, YRC, which is a logistics company, is based along College Boulevard, Black & Veatch, which is one of the largest engineering firms uh, in the country, is, is based along College Boulevard, AMC um, has their headquarters just south of College Boulevard at 115th Street, uh, for perspective, the Royals on 113th Street, so we're right there, um, and, and that's where the majority of the of the major office uh, traffic has been. It's named College Boulevard because just to the west of the Royale is Johnson County Community College, uh, which is a full-time equivalent school um, that is, is a relatively sizable community college where you might have folks going there to get an associate's degree with the idea of going to a, a state school or something after that. Um, so very well-to-do area, very popular area. Um, and then you see on this map here, 435 Highway is the beltway around the Kansas City metropolitan area. So if you follow that um, around to the west, you can get up to the Legends where the, the uh, Sporting KC um, Stadium is, where the racetrack is. If you follow to the east, you can get to where the Royal Stadium is and the Chiefs Stadium. Um, and so, uh, and then if you take 69 North straight from the Royale, and you go on to 35, that's how you get into downtown. Um, and that 35 highway runs from Mexico to Canada. Uh, it's been called the NAFTA corridor. So it's a major, major um, spine for trucking and logistics distribution. What you don't see on this map is also I-70, which runs from Sacramento to 
Baltimore effectively, which is another logistical uh, highway. So Kansas City is known for uh, being a major engineering hub, being a major trucking hub, but the economy of the area itself is is broad and generally mirrors that of the national economy in terms of its performance. Um, as it relates to our firm, Block Real Estate Services, Block Funds, um, Block was founded in 1945, and it was it was founded by Alan Block, who is the father of the three principals now. Um, the three brothers now own and, and operate the company, including Ken Block, Steve Block, and Michael Block. Ken Block is the managing member of this particular deal. Uh, he's also the managing principal of the firm, and has a has a track record in the in the Kansas City market of being the top owner, operator, manager. Um, you know, really one of the dominant players, developers in this space. Um, and so there's a long history here uh, of the firm and of this family, um, as well as a long track record of success in the market in terms of building projects, building always at the top end of the spectrum. So our, our reputation as a firm is to build class A properties. We intentionally don't build in the class B space. Uh, we don't want to have functional obsolescence. Uh, it reflects on a reputation. It, it allows us to do more transactions in municipalities that want our type of projects. Um, and it creates a certain amount of incentives from some of those uh, other municipalities. In this particular case, as we look at City Place, the development, um, part of the things that we were able to accomplish due to our track record is that uh, the road that connects through the property, Schweitzer, uh, through the city place development uh, was something that the city built at their cost, uh, which is a pretty significant savings to the the property owners in this uh, in this deal. Uh, if we could, Hunter, go back down to the site plan of city place, and I'll sort of start to narrow in on the uh, the development itself. So city place, the ground under this development had been owned by uh, the Saul family, um, which is a very well-to-do family, East Coast family. Um, and they had originally proposed a development back in 1984, when much of this area was developed. And as a as a result of sort of the 86 tax change, um, they elected not to move forward. The family sat on the property for uh, almost 30 years, and we had continually been interested in that property, um, but never uh, really had the ability to acquire it. And um, had made several offers on the asset, but um, you know, we're always turned down or just ignored at that point. So it, there was a time, like I said, back in probably 2012, 2013, where the Saul family had indicated to their attorney that they would be potentially willing to sell this property. That attorney happened to be our attorney. And so we were able to negotiate for the land for City Place um, on an off-market transaction um, directly with the family and acquire that property for what you see here, which is the master plan of the development. Uh, the master plan of City Place really includes 10 parcels. Um, what you see is four parcels designated towards multifamily development, four parcels designated towards office development, and then one parcel that is strictly retail pad sites, uh, where you can see that it's defined in the green box on the screen here as the market at City Place. And then on the very southeast portion of the property, there's actually a senior living facility called the Sheridan at Overland Park. We sold the property underneath the Sheridan to a group called CA Ventures out of Chicago. Uh, that group built the uh, the Sheridan, and it's it's operated now uh, by them. Um, from my understanding, the project has been very successful. Uh, it's full operating, and um, you know is is being enjoyed by their residents. Within the remainder of City Place, uh, the Royale is the first project that we took on as a development. And so we we built that property um, over the course of the last several years. Uh, and then right now, under development, and you can actually see the steel and the parking lot's already been built. On this map, it's CPCC3, City Place Corporate Center 3. And that is actually the office building that is closest to the Royale. So it faces the property. And that building will be the home of Metaware. Uh, Metaware is a medical software company. They were acquired last year by um, a venture capital firm out of San Francisco uh, that actually I think is like a $75 billion firm. They continue to grow Metaware. Um, and so they are taking at least two floors, possibly three floors 
of what is a four-story office building at CPCC3, City Place Corporate Center 3. And that property will deliver in May of 2019. So at that point, you'll have somewhere between 500 and 600 people working every day there. On its ultimate build out, the offices at City Place will have approximately 600,000 square feet of office space. Uh, what that means is approximately 2,400 to 3,000 employees working there every day, plus their guests and invitees. On the residential side, in the orange um, boundary line, we are entitled to build 1,392 multifamily units in sort of this configuration although that configuration could change over time. Uh, and then within the market at City Place, which includes the four pad sites in green, as well as 18,000 feet of retail on the first floor of the Apex, which is directly north of the Royale, there's approximately 40,000 feet of retail. And so that's, that's the synergy that we're hoping to create is a, is a mixed use, a horizontal mixed use, as opposed to a vertical mixed use development where there's these uses that interact with each other very well. You've got daytime traffic from the office buildings, you've got the evening traffic from the residences, uh, and then you have really what we call service retail. And so that retail will primarily be things like restaurants, um, dry cleaning, um, you know, we have an urgent care that's interested in one of the pad sites, for example, but things that are there to provide services for the people that work and live in that area. Um, and there's actually, a pretty significant amount of interest in those four pad sites. We have LOIs for three of the four. Um, and so we think that as we move ahead with the city place development uh, and continue to round out this, this horizontal mixed use village, um, that adding those retail services will actually help boost uh, the existing rates at Royale, even though that's not necessarily reflected in our underwriting today. So in that context, what I wanted to do is then sort of start to unpack the Royale itself. And, and kind of talk about the theory behind the property, uh, why it was built the way it is, the history of our development, and, and where we are today. The Royale is planned as a 344 unit uh, multifamily project in the main building um, uh, where you can see the, the U shape uh, with the courtyard in the center. Um, there are 205 units. And so the remaining units are in what we think of as more traditional suburban multifamily buildings to the south. And if you, if you look at that site plan, um, what you'll see is we actually step down the elevation of the building from four stories on top of a garage um, at, the, at the main building. And then you step down to four stories next to that, not on top of a garage. And then you go down to three stories as we get closer to the neighborhood. The idea there is to make a nice transition between the the two story projects that um, you know two story homes and 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 duplexes that are to the south of the property um, in order to in order to sort of match the the other neighborhood design standards and so um, we began the construction of the royale um, back in twenty sixteen and we completed the the main building with the two hundred and five units. Um, and really a significant portion of the four su suburban garden style buildings. Um, but in, in March of 2017, we actually had a fire and it burned to the ground the two southeastern buildings um, in the Royale. And that comprised 69 total units. Um, the package that you have in the offering documents was actually put together probably in July. and at that point in time, um, those last two buildings were still being reconstructed. We have received our certificates of occupancy for those last two buildings, the last one coming at the end of August. And for those of you that are familiar with construction, um, that really means that about two weeks ago when I was out there on our lender tour, um, you know, you really started to see the site itself, landscaping and, and, and all the construction really be cleaned up and presentable in a format that was leasable. So uh, we've had about 69 units that have not been constructed obviously until now. Those are the units that are in lease up between now and the end of the year. Um, we have, as of the weekly report that I get from our leasing agents yesterday, uh, 44 available units uh, in the property. And if you think about that in, in the, 
in the context of our, our underwritten occupancy at 95%, uh, with a 5% vacancy, that leaves us with about 18 vacant units. Um, and so if I take that away from the 44, it puts us in a position where to stabilize, we need to lease about 26 units uh, over the next three or four months um, to, to really reach our, our projected performa uh, which is on page 59 of the of the OM. So, from that standpoint, we're very comfortable um, with the leasing velocity that we've had. You know, there were several weeks uh, for the past few weeks where we've been doing six, seven, eight leases a week, um, as we had new supply that was able to match some of the demand that we couldn't fill with with the existing properties that were already full. Um, and we'll see how that goes over the next couple of months. But we should be in a position that. Uh, by the time we're funding this, um, and and even today, we're we're still within pretty close reach of our of our stabilized occupancy. The history of the property development itself uh, is that we built the property in a in a joint venture partnership with Carlisle, and Carlisle is a pension fund advisor uh, based in Virginia, and they're an institution in in that they allocate money for pension funds, endowments, and things like that. Their objective is to typically cycle capital uh, very quickly. And when we when we were discussing this deal with Carlisle, um, you know, they indicated a desire to exit the property, uh, you know, as quickly as possible, given their typical time constraints and the fact that we had already been delayed in delivery of the last few units by the fire. Really, to maximize the value of the property to to get a higher value, um, we probably would have been out in the market. Um, in the spring of, of 2019. And we were able to come to an agreement with them to acquire their interest in the property um, at a value that we felt like was favorable to the market uh, based on the, the opinions of value that we received from three different real estate brokers, national firms, uh, CBRE, HFF, and ARA all provided us with broker opinions of value. Uh, that information was shared with our team and with Carlisle. And we were able to uh, work out a deal with them for a, a price that was below those valuations, um, not significantly, but um, to a point that we felt good about uh, where we were in the deal. So to um, uh, to transition from sort of the background of the of the financing and the deal itself, we're in a position to buy them out. We're in a position to stabilize the property over the next month or so, maybe month and a half. And going forward, um, the intent of this deal is that it is a, a stable, institutional, first-class property. I would tell you that after having toured um, nearly all of the properties in our market, especially those that we're competitive with, um, the Royale is, is probably the nicest property in Johnson County, uh, which is our, our sort of uh, high-end suburb. And and it, if it has competitors, those competitors might be found in, in one or two deals that are um, downtown or, or in a more urban setting. But, um, you know, really top of the market in terms of the physical asset itself. Um, I don't know if we have any photos, Hunter, of, of the property, but it they speak to some of the quality, although it's, it's really hard to get a sense of it until you um, are at the property itself. But on that big deck, that is in the amenity area. Oh, here's a picture of it. When we when we first had this photo taken, um, I asked our our marketing people. I I said I don't want a rendering. I want a picture. And they said, well, that actually is a picture, not just an architectural mm -hmm. rendering. So um, what you can see on the on the amenity deck is there's two two grill and TV cabana areas. You can see those roofs that are above those. Those roofs actually open and close automatically based on light levels and moisture levels. So if it rains, they'll close. Uh, if it's sunny outside, they'll open and allow the sun to go through. Um, you can adjust them uh, by remote control as well if you want to if you want to do something different than what they're doing. But really kind of neat. You've got the cabana stations that sort of run alongside the the pool and the hot tub there. Um, you know the grill stations, so you can do that outside. Um, sort of grilling atmosphere with the outdoor kitchen. Outdoor kitchen's also got TVs in it and so forth in case you want to watch games and things like that. There's a large fire pit with a lot of seating around that for congregating. Uh, on the left-hand side, I, it's not really as easy to see on this picture, but on the upper left-hand side of this photo, there's actually a putting green. 
um, on the deck there. So if you're a golfer, you can come out and do that. And then on the other side of the grill station, there is a uh, bocce ball court. So, you know, really tried to make the deck area a place where people can come, hang out. And the idea of living in the main building is really this resort style living. So the the residents there love it. They can take the elevator down. They can go to all these things. And then if we if you have any photos of our clubhouse, uh, Hunter, we can look at those. But the the inside the clubhouse, you have the the pool tables, you have the media lounge. We actually have a, a spa, so you can actually schedule with a uh, one of two massage therapists regular massages um, in our spa. There's a red light therapy room. Uh, we have a full first class fitness center uh, with all of the modern amenities and equipment. We have a concierge. Um, that is there. So if you look on your left-hand side of this photo, uh, well, now it's probably straight ahead. You can see there's a concierge desk. So the concierge does things like arrange for travel to the airport if you need car service. Uh, they might walk your dog for you from time to time, things like that. And then you can see the, the kitchen on the left-hand side. Those, those walls actually slide out. You can close that off, reserve it for uh, birthday parties, baby showers, you know, whatever else the case is. Um, down the hall that you can kind of see the picture straight ahead on, uh, we actually have what we call a company kitchen. And it's a little kiosk station where you can pick up snacks, milk, pre-made sandwiches, some meals. Uh, there's four or five coolers there as well, some dry goods. It's on an honor system and the tenants just scan their, their credit cards. The mail room is, is interesting because what we've seen now is a trend toward um, what they call sort of like a parcel lounge, a place where you can sit, you talk to your neighbors, you can unpack your mail. And then on the right side, what you see here in this in this sort of purple checkered um, custom design is what we call parcel pending. And instead of having a package left on your doorstep, or instead of that package having to be carted into the office and our office manager sign for the package, the UPS and the FedEx guys now take the Amazon deliveries directly to this kiosk. They punch in a code, uh, the appropriate size locker opens, they put your parcel in that, and then it sends the resident a text with a one-time unique code to punch into the system. And then when that resident comes in and punches that code in, the locker opens, they retrieve their package, the code is wiped out, and the box itself resets for the next package delivery. Um, our residents love the convenience of that. We love not having the staff time taken up with, with things like this and automating this function. Uh, we also like not having the liability of sitting on people's packages uh, all year long. So again, just things like this that are, um, you know, that system is probably a $35,000 system, but in terms of the amount of time and liability it saves us and the amount of convenience um, and upgrades for our residents, it's certainly something that we think uh, helps differentiate our properties. If we wanna to go to some of the other slides here, Hunter, we can see some of the other pictures. This is the media lounge. And then you get into the units themselves. The units themselves have, um, all of them have stainless steel appliances, which you can see here. The premium units actually have um, a slightly higher end stove and, and dishwasher, where on the dishwasher, for example, the controls are on the top panel. Every unit has a wine fridge uh, and a side-by-side -side refrigerator with an in-in refrigerator ice maker and water distribution system. Um, in a premium unit, you can see that the pendants might be upgraded, but if you look, for example, on the left-hand side, you can see that there's tile all the way up that backsplash. And in a typical apartment, you might see four inches, even in a granite countertop or a quartz countertop, and this is quartz, which is deemed to be the top of the market. You know, you might see tile up there for four or five inches. And in our case, we wanted to make it feel like a true residential home, something that was comparable to the expensive houses in the area that we see. So. These are the finishes inside the units. Uh, we can continue to kind of go through those, Hunter, if you'd like. You'll also notice on that last picture, the, the balconies to the outside um, don't have spandrel panels or, or spandrels connecting the railings. You can actually see those are glass balconies. And the idea with the glass balconies, again, the more expensive is to preserve the views that you might have especially the views of the residents that look into the amenity courtyard. Looking back towards the kitchen. Uh, 
And then I think, Hunter, if we can just see one of the restrooms, that's a king size bed, large bedrooms. And then in the restroom, you've got your his and her vanities. Um, so you've got the dual sinks, which people really appreciate. And then what you look, if you can see in the mirror or on the left-hand side in the shower, there's sort of two distinctive things that you'll see that differentiate ours from other apartments. The first is the full tile wall all the way up. And in most apartments, you'll see a plastic surround. Um, and in our case, we've upgraded. So again, it feels more like a luxury single family home. And the second is that glass shower curtain. Um, that's something that uh, is between six and $900 per unit but is something that distinguishes us from just something where you might have the uh, the curved rod and so forth. So as you can see, what we're trying to do here is really build the top of the market, um, top of the line finishes, top of the line amenities. Uh, and from our perspective, we, we think that gives us an edge over our competition. We build smart, efficient floor plans. Um, those floor plans tend to achieve strong rents relative to their competitors. Um, and then I think kind of where I'm going to go next is is probably transition into the financials themselves. Um, you know, we've we've got our our projections in the model, and one of the good things about um, how we're doing this deal, well, there's several there's several positives to sort of the way that this um, this transaction is assembled. The first is, uh, from our perspective, we're using a significant amount of equity, and in a lot of transactions you'll see, including our own, we might lever the property up to say 75% loan to value. Now there are others where you can see mezzanine debt um, or other sorts of financing where you might take that up to 80 or 85 or 90% of the capital stack, but in a traditional financing setting, you might lever to 75% with 25% cash. What you'll see here is that our loan amount at the 45 million 750 represents a loan to value of about 57.7%. And from our perspective, there's a great deal of security in that um, lower leverage point that um, uh, provides a, a, a pretty safe place for the investors to be. We also compared that with a loan that started higher and amortized over time, and we actually end up in a better place under this scenario than we did if we say started out at 75% and amortized that on a 30-year basis, which would be typical of, of a multifamily property. So lower leverage deal, institutional quality, again, you know, with, with a pension fund partner, the likely buyers of this deal on an exit are going to be pension funds, REITs, uh, large private equity managers, things of that nature. So as an institutional exit, um, you typically see higher liquidity in those markets, regardless of sort of the market timing or market cycle. Those are groups that tend to have money to invest um, in and out of cycles. And so there's a greater likelihood of, of sort of having a, uh, a liquidity in, in the event that it was needed. Uh, and then what I want to do is sort of dive into the underwriting itself. The the underwriting that you have in in uh, the offering memorandum that we turned out on, on page 59 of that, again, as I said, the, there's a year one and then there's sort of a true year one. And the first year one is really the performance that we believe the property will generate between September of this year and the end of 2018. Um, and then really in our underwriting, we started the model in 2019 sort of as a stabilized deal. And so from that standpoint, um, you, can, you can get a feel for uh, where we are on a stabilized basis on a go forward. But the idea is that as we were underwriting the property, because we already own the property, because we already operate the property, uh, we have a very good handle on um, the operating expenses, which in our model are above 7,000 per unit. And that's important because typically you might see newer properties be in the 5,500 to $6,000 a door, maybe pushing 6,500. Um, for something that's really expensive or has a higher tax taxable consequence. But the the scenario that we have here is really spending money where we feel like we can create value for our residents with the concierge, uh, which adds to your payroll cost, making sure that we're adequately accounting for turnover costs, um, repairs and maintenance and things of that nature. And what we don't want to do is have things that are what we call below the NOI line um, that aren't accounted for. So in our in our position uh, as the operator of the property, we're using the true historical operations along with 
you know, what we think the cost will be to bring on these these additional two buildings. So, you know, the numbers that you see in, in the underwriting here coincide with the numbers that are in our 2019 operating budget. And we're in budget season. The fourth quarter is budget season for multifamily managers. So we are um, using what I think is, is really good data uh, in our underwriting as we look forward to the uh, expected rents, expected expenses, things of that nature. You know, they're really based on on what's in place. Um, so from that standpoint, I feel like we're we're being conservative in a way, and we don't reflect any increase that would possibly come from the delivery of the office building, for example, where you have 500 more people working there every day, some of which already have a place to live, and some of which would really like to live in a resort right next to their office. Um, and there's no pop in rent accounted for for when the retail comes online, and now you have a place to go get a sandwich or an ice cream cone or do your dry cleaning or, or take your girlfriend out on a nice date, any of those things. So, you know, the the idea that we're using existing rents, we're graduating those with inflation, um, the same as our expenses, we think is, is conservative, um, but it reflects sort of the conservative nature of the overall investment. And um, and that's why we think it's something that uh, we are, we're really fond of. I would also say that of the $33 million in cash, that's required to close this transaction, we are trading that that money, those funds in from the sale of two other properties. And so when we sold, we sold an office building in Leewood, which is adjacent to Overland Park on the east side. And we sold a multifamily property in Northwest Arkansas. And we're using this, the proceeds from those sales to trade into this deal. Um, the offering that we have before you with Crowd Street is to acquire the shares of uh, some of the individuals who used to own those properties who would like to sell their shares uh, in those traded entities. So of the 33 million uh, that is trading into the deal, we might have 5 million or 7 million of investors that would like to exit that transaction. And so what we'll be using the funds for uh, in City Place Royale investors is to acquire their ownership stake in this property. But that transaction should close uh, either Thursday of this week or Friday, and it will happen in advance of us raising funds for uh, the City Place Royale investor entity. So as you invest, um, if you invest, uh, those funds will be used to acquire those shares uh, at the time that they come through. So the transaction itself will already be closed. The loan that we've put forth in the offering package is the loan that's being used to acquire the property. Now uh, those terms are already fixed, the rate is already locked, um, the deal will be done, all the title, all the survey, um, all of the details relative to a, a property of this size and scale uh, will have been transacted at that point, um, which is another thing that, again, I think makes it a little more conservative than maybe um, some traditional offerings. So uh, that's where we are. We feel like the Royale is a, is a great deal. Um, we welcome the participation of other investors alongside our capital. And uh, and I think at this point now, Hunter, I'll turn it over to any questions that uh, investors might have. Excellent. Thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, we did have a number of investor questions come through, but I just want to remind investors, if you had any questions or as any arise, please type them into the questions box. Um, and with that, the first question that came in, um, one investor noticed that on the map, there are a couple other large multifamily developments plan right next door. Do you expect that to change your rent demand dynamics? Um, will that affect your rent base in any way? We feel like the development of the other properties um, will actually be accretive to what we're doing here, and in particular, the apex. And so, again, kind of looking at this map, uh, we are entitled to build I think close to 1,400 units. I want to say it's like 1,392 in terms of the total unit count. And so what we're doing right now in real time is is we're preparing to close on the construction loan with the with UBS, uh, which is an institutional partner of ours, uh, to build the apex. And the apex is immediately north of the Royale. It will have 370 units. And those units are scheduled to come online in approximately two years. So for the Royale, there'll be two years of operations before there's necessarily competitive um, competing product in the market. But 
there, there's a couple of advantages to the way that uh, we're going to develop the rest of the property. The one is that Block will typically serve as the developer for the remaining parcels. And part of the reason why when it came time to um, acquire or sell the Royale, uh, we looked to acquire that was because by having common control um, by the managing member being Ken in both deals, you know, we're able to avoid a scenario where we where we cut each other off and, and where we're cutting rents within the same uh, within the same community. Now, there's no guarantee that we would be the developer for the two properties on the west side. Um, there's also no timeline for those in terms of when they might be started. But typically, just like in the case of the Apex, uh, a new lender, a new construction lender is going to require that the next property be the last property be built and stabilized before they're ready to advance on a new property. So I think from that standpoint, um, you know, any any of the new properties west of the Royale or on sort of on the northwest corner of 113th and City Place Way, which is the driveway that sort of intersects uh, the, the multifamily portion of the site, um, what you're probably going to need to see is two years of construction for the apex plus the time that it takes to stabilize that before you would see a new property. So I could see a scenario where you have about 300, maybe 350 units delivered, um, you know, every three years, for example. And from our standpoint, again, given the infill nature of this development, uh, if you look at the new, I want to call it greenfield sites that are available in the market that haven't been built on yet, um, you really need to go about three miles south or or about two and a half, three miles west um, to find those type of opportunities. And so even though we'll be building supply, we're building supply in an area that was mostly constructed in the 1980s uh, in terms of its residential housing stock. If you look at the homes to the north, the homes to the south or west, um, and, and what you're seeing is there's a natural limit to the amount of supply that can be built immediately around us. So if you compared this to say going out to 159th Street and 69 Highway or you know, 167th where Blue Hawk is now under development, um, there you have hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of acres in the immediate proximity, some of which is gonna be built as other things, but ultimately all of which today is available for potential multifamily development. And so we feel like there is at least some protection by being an infill site, uh, some protection by having common control so that we don't uh, necessarily cut each other off. And then the the thing that Apex will bring to the development that hasn't been there before really is that retail uh, deal. And so the having the retail um, will certainly, we think, aid in the leasing, not detract from the leasing at the Royale. Um, it, it, the other thing that, that I, I failed to mention, but probably should be understood, is that the Royale was built and leased up in the middle of a very heavy construction zone. Um, if you look at the development of Schweitzer Road and 113th Street, if you look at all the rock that we drilled out of the side of the hill to build the apex, which eventually will come, um, the people living in the Royale uh, are living there in a, in a time and a place where there's a fire at the property, there's reconstruction happening within their own community, there's construction happening all around them on roads, infrastructures, things like that, dirt work, site work, um, in an area that really hasn't ever been truly what I call buttoned up. And now that the Royale is completely buttoned up, and once you see City Place Corporate Center 3 get buttoned up, that pond between them also being completely finished, now you add the apex and the retail on the east side of the apex, and you get that buttoned up, and now you really have a central core that's sort of, of centered around that that roundabout. Uh, the roundabout, by the way, looks great, is landscaped well, and has a has a really significant piece of, of outdoor art in it. But now you have people that are leasing in an area that's not under construction, that looks nice, that has the functionality that we've been looking for from that live, work, play dynamic that doesn't even exist there today. So I think that as this whole community gets buttoned up more and more, um, you'll actually see probably outsized rent growth that starts to compete with some of the other rents that you see um, maybe sort of over at Park Place or Mission Farms where those projects have been buttoned up a little longer and their rents might be a dollar sixty five to a dollar eighty and here we're at a dollar fifty three dollar fifty five so um, we feel pretty good about where we're headed 
uh, with City Place overall and, and what that's going to do to the Royale value over time. Excellent. Thanks, Aaron. Um, one question I just want to address because a few other investors have already reached out and then there's a few others I'd like to jump back into, but when do you plan to begin making distributions for this investment? November. Next month. November 2018? Yeah. Yeah, it's Excellent. cash flowing already. Um, and so we'll probably start them at that 5.7 rate and then bump that up in the course of, you know, into the into the sixes next year. Um, as the last few units are leased up, these last, you know, there's 26 to get to stabilization in our mind. So we might be there by the time we get this entire investment buttoned up, but uh, we'll distribute the cash that we have available, which will be in that upper fives, low to mid sixes as a percentage of capital invested. Excellent. Um, so per the OM, one investor saw average rents have dropped year over year at the property. Uh, for example, two bedroom tenants. Um, why is that? And do you believe this trend will reverse going forward? Yeah, I don't think that that's necessarily true on a on a year to year basis. Uh, what they might be seeing is a scenario where the garden style buildings that we're delivering now lease for less than the resort style building that we delivered back in 2017. Um, people are willing to pay a premium to be in the in the units that are in the what we call the main building or the hotel building. Um, so what you might be seeing is simply the effect of the the units that are available today. Those 69 units are the ones that probably rent for less than the ones that the the main building rents for. But our rents are going up, not down, at the property overall. Excellent. So this is a question from the same investor and might be correlated to your answer you just gave. But it says um, you're getting rents quite a bit higher than some of your comps, uh, especially in some of the larger units. Do you expect that to continue going forward? Or might you see some reversion to that uh, that mean there? Well, it, it depends on which comp set you use, but I would submit that we're at the very top of the Johnson County market. And on a per square foot basis, when we blend our stuff together, it's a dollar fifty three or dollar fifty five. And if you compare that to Park Place, Highlands Lodge, Mission Farms, Mission One Hundred Six, you know those projects are anywhere from like I said, a dollar sixty five to a dollar eighty. Um, you know, there's probably less comparable product immediately around us because there just hasn't been stuff built um, in this area because the land is sort of spoken for. But as you look east along 435, where there were some sites, um, those were the numbers. So I feel like uh, from our standpoint, if if we're reverting to a mean that reflects our comp set, it would be upward, not a, not a downward um, reversion. But I think that the the, the more important point is that if you look at the two bedroom units, for example, um, a lot of our two bedroom units are on the corners of these buildings and they have these incredibly large outdoor patios where you can put an outdoor living room furniture set up, they're covered. Um, and that square footage that's added to the livable space, even though it's not indoors and therefore isn't reflected in our rents or necessarily in our square footage of the unit, those are on on the on the corners of the building. So if if the U is an upside down U, that's going to be sort of on the southern tip of the main building, and then obviously on the end caps of the suburban style buildings. Those are really large patios, and that may factor into the desirability of our two bedrooms relative to others that would be in the market. Excellent. And to clarify my earlier question about uh, when distributions begin. At what frequency will those distributions be made? Is it an annual, monthly, or quarterly distribution? Uh, Block typically does our distributions on a monthly basis, and that's our expectation here. Excellent. Um, one investor was curious, uh, what's driven rent growth negative amongst your comps in the last year? Uh, sounds like that previous question might have addressed that. Yeah, and I don't I don't see rent growth negative among our comps. I was actually CBRE hosted an apartment summit um, for most of the large owners and developers in the market um, last what was it last Thursday, and so I was there, and I I believe their indication was that in our comp set, which is Johnson County, their data tracks an increase in rents of about 2.9 percent in the Class A multifamily space. Um, and so that's that's coming from an independent third party, you know. Again, they're they're a publicly traded 
national or international real estate platform. And so they do a pretty good job of tracking that data. But what I've seen just, just anecdotally at our property is um, we, we had what I would call slower leasing velocity during the time that we had filled up the property. You know, when you're 97%, you don't have as many available units. So if you come by looking for a two bedroom on the corner and we only have a one bedroom in the middle, you know, we may not be a fit for you, but you know, our leasing activity on a renewal basis, uh, our retention's been good. Uh, you know, our, our expectation, we start our bonus pool on retention in the, in the low 40% range. And then we really try to incentivize our people to get that retention number into the, into the middle fifties, uh, on a retention basis. And I believe this property is tracking at like 52% retention, um, which is a, is a testament to the, desirability of the of the tenants to stay there when their lease comes up um and then you know the other thing that we've seen in when we had units come available at the end of august uh, our pace in that in that three or four week span um and i get weekly leasing reports from the the, the, the folks on site you know went from being maybe four units a, a week over the summertime and a lot of that's a function of what we have available in renewals to eight, nine, uh, one week. I think we hit 11 leases when we had some of those units available. So I do think that um, there's there's pretty strong demand for the product that we've built here. Um, and, and we've tried, like I said, really hard to differentiate ourselves from even the competitive set that exists in our, in our suburban market. So we feel like we're on a good trend line. Um, and in particular, as construction gets cleaned up, um, we're going to be able to push those rents a little harder. Some of the rents that are in the property are a function of the fact that we had a fire in two of those suburban style buildings. And when that occurred, we leased those units at rents um, in the main building at the rents in these suburban buildings to accommodate them. When someone plans on moving in in April and you burn the building down in March, they still need a place to live. And they still feel like they have a deal with you as the landlord for a unit. And so we might have had somebody who had scheduled to move into a suburban style building in March or April or May of 17, but no longer had a unit, um, but they had leased a unit in the suburban buildings at a lower rent. We went ahead and moved them into the main building. And what we haven't seen is, is necessarily the roll up of all of those units up to the market level yet. So I think there's still some room potentially to run with some of that as well. Um, as we work through those uh, renewals and extensions over time, or as they're unwilling to pay the freight to be in the main building and they can move back into the suburban building and we can get a new tenant who's willing to pay more for the main building. So um, I feel like on our, uh, on our market trend, you know, we're still absorbing the units that are being built in the market. Um, and I feel like on a rent growth trend, we're, we're feeling positive about that at the property level and at the macro level. Excellent. And one investor was curious if there were uh, concessions offered during the lease up, and if so, what kind? Absolutely. Um, and it depends on the time and what we had available and what unit um, type was, was leasing better than others. So we use what we call um, uh, rent, rent optimizing software. And for those in the industry, you, you set basic parameters around where your minimum rents can be. Uh, and then the, the optimization software actually calibrates that rent uh, up and down above a certain, like I said, above a certain baseline based on, um, you know, if you have eight two bedrooms available and you only have one one bedroom, that one one bedroom pricing is going to be more expensive the day that you go to look at it. And it recalibrates rent every night. So, um, so we try to do it that way. There are times when you'll give away some other concessions, for example, on the post fire scenario, um, you know, we were giving more concessions to try to be accommodated to people who may have been disrupted, um, you know, working through that typically in our market, particularly in the winter time, when the velocity slows down, you know, between, I'm going to say Thanksgiving and Valentine's day, um, you'll see one month on a 13 month lease is pretty typical. Uh, if you're willing to move in the winter time, the traffic is less, uh, there's fewer people walking through the door and most communities are gonna give away something during the holidays uh, or during during those months just to try to generate some traffic because 
leasing that unit with one month free in November is better than waiting to March and, and leasing it with no months free uh, from our standpoint. So, you know, I'm sure that last winter we probably did that or something similar to that. Um, but most of it's driven by the the rent optimization software that we use in the in the deal. Um, and that'll, like I said, that calibrates rents like it does airline prices. You know, it, it just, it changes them every day. The, the important part about that is it also creates emergency for the residents because if you're renting a unit and you are online and you can buy now or you come back and it's going to be different tomorrow, um, it does compel them from time to time to uh, push the buy now button. Excellent. And one investor was curious um, if you anticipate to make any additional capital calls. I don't think that we would make additional capital calls. There's no guarantee of that. I want to make sure that we're perfectly clear that um, any deal at any time, given whatever the circumstance might be, may require a capital call. Um, but in this key case, we've got a million dollars effectively for what we call lease up carry and reserves. Probably won't end up using that lease up carry because of where we're already at with the property, but that was set aside at a time when we were thinking we might go out in July before we had the, the property fully delivered. Um, so with a million dollars in a bank account and a, and a fairly conservative leverage point, you know, under 58% leverage, uh, we should be able to manage our cash flows uh, pretty well. You know, that said, if there's some sort of, of event where we might have to have a capital call, then, um, you know, we would we would go ahead and proceed with that. Excellent. And that actually translates well to the next question. Uh, one investor is curious that if the property is currently cash flowing, why is the why is there a budget for lease up and carry? Yeah, and again, that's that's a function of probably having put this book together, um, you know, two and a half months ago, when we weren't even delivered on those units. Um, now we've seen not only those units delivered, but several of those units leased. So we're probably being a little bit overly conservative there, but um, that's okay. You know, and, and if we end up in a situation where we're sitting on too much cash, we may do a special distribution as well. Um, but from our perspective, when you're locking in a 10-year loan uh, and there's not a lot of opportunity to go back and maybe refinance for capital improvements, things like that, we're better off starting with a million dollars in the bank, um, making sure we know where, where we're at, making sure that we've calibrated it correctly, which we believe we have. Um, and not giving anybody any surprises. And if we get to a point where we're accumulating cash, we may increase the distribution or we may do a one-time special distribution uh, if we feel like that's appropriate at that particular time. Excellent, so uh, we're coming up here on our finish time in about five minutes. There's at least two more questions, but I just wanna invite investors to ask any last minute questions they may have. Um, one investor was curious about uh, fire insurance, seeing as that the property previously had to deal with this. Um, could you share if this property currently has fire insurance or how you dealt with the previous fire? Absolutely. We were fully insured. Every one of our properties is fully insured. Um, and the, the, the damages that were created by the prior fire were actually covered under the builder's risk policy. They were not on our policy. They were on the contractor's policy. The cost to rebuild the property uh, that was damaged was about $11 million. That was borne by the contractor's insurance. And then there was some liability that came along with the houses to the south that also burned as a result of our building going up in flames. Um, and those were those were handled by the subcontractor's liability policy as well as the general contractor's policy. Our policy never got touched in that scenario. Uh, all of those insurance claims have been settled out. Um, we're starting with a clean slate here and anything that was a claim that might come back up would would come back up you know, against the prior ownership, not against this ownership. But the um, the property is fully insured, fully you know, fully insured property casualty, um, you know, and it's it's really under our master umbrella. On top of property and casualty, which provide for full replacement, we also typically carry a fifty million dollar liability umbrella. So if something were to happen, not just to our property, but to someone who is visiting our property or someone near our property that we were held liable for, that $50 million stands behind that um, on a blanket basis for our portfolio. So we we certainly take the insurance stuff seriously. We're fully insured. We had no losses relative to the incident um, at this property. 
and we wouldn't anticipate any uninsured losses unless it was something catastrophic where we were just completely beyond anybody's wildest imagination. But um, we were sufficiently insured in our opinion um, and would be in a position to take care of any claims. Excellent. Um, and briefly, could you touch on Block's track record? Yeah, happy to. Um, Block, like I said, has been around since 1945. Today, we're the largest um, commercial manager in the Kansas City area. We, we have about 42 million square feet of commercial property under management. We have about 7,000 units of multifamily under management. Our footprint on commercial is regional, stretching from really a triangle between Chicago, South Florida, and Las Vegas. So we got the Middle West and the Sun Markets, Sun Belt Markets. And then on the multifamily side, we're a little bit more centralized. We're kind of up and down the center core between, um, you know, our main markets are Kansas City. Uh, we've got deals in, well, let me just, Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana. And then we have one deal in Indianapolis. So um, we're kind of focused in that, in that central and south central corridor of the U.S., um, have a great multifamily management team, Block Multifamily Group. Uh, that is a related company, uh, also under common control with uh, with Ken. Um, and their task, obviously, is to ensure the performance of the assets and and so forth. So we do have an asset manager uh, in place that is actually an owner's rep uh, on behalf of the ownership that oversees Block Multifamily as well. His name is Jason Charkett, and um, he comes to us with a great deal of, of experience here too, as well as myself and Ken and everybody else. We live here, we're, we're near this property all the time uh, and have the ability to show up unannounced. We have the FOB so we can walk around and see what there is to see. And um, I'm, I'm probably at the Royale twice a month, um, announced or unannounced uh, for some sort of business. So, you know, our oversight, especially with this in our backyard, not, not down, the, down the street or down the highway, uh, in some other state uh, is, is right under our thumb here. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thanks so much for your time today, Aaron. Uh, thanks to all the investors who joined us today and for your questions. A couple of things I just want to highlight before we part ways is if you look on your screen right here, I'm scrolling down to the questions portion of the offering detail page. If you have any further questions during your due diligence, please don't hesitate to enter it here. And if you send the block real estate services in CrowdStreet, both parties will receive the message in their email inbox and will follow up within a 24-hour period. Lastly, I just wanted to touch on that this project can currently only accept 800,000 more from CrowdStreet, CrowdStreet investors. So if you're planning to invest, I may recommend placing that offer and um, then completing the investor workflow. The last day to submit offers for this project will be October 15th. And again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to the CrowdStreet Investor Relations team or block directly through that questions box. And with that, I just want to say thanks so much again, Aaron. We look forward to continuing this raise with you and your team. Thanks, Hunter. We appreciate everyone's time. Uh, we're certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have um, and look forward to the Royale being a success for our investors. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone.